Today we're talking about disclosure and abuses. So this links up to the things that you've done about public companies. <clears throat> this is an overview of the sort of things that the company needs to do when they're trying to enter a stock market and the information that they need to provide. And this uh, links up uh, with what we have done in the past on the importance of disclosure as a counterbalance to limited liability and separate corporate personality and so on. You give all these great protections to company insiders. What do you give everybody else? What do you give everybody else? And the way that this scale is ba balanced is by giving them more information. So the company is obligated to reveal a great deal of things about itself that under normal circumstances it would not like to tell people because the companies are not that keen on sharing the sort of intimate financial details with everybody else. But they have to do it as a legal obligation because on the other side you've got a group of people who are protected by uh, limited liability. <clears throat> this is the way that the system addresses the various concerns about perhaps the excessive protections that are given to shareholders. So we'll talk about this a little bit and then we talk about particular instances where inappropriate behavior as regards dealing with information can get people in trouble. And there's quite a lot of regulatory <coughs> tools that have developed to deal with the idea or to promote the idea of a fair market where everybody has the same opportunity to participate. So if somebody has got extra information that is not available to everybody else, they get an unfair advantage. Is This is something that the regulatory framework is trying to prevent. So we're going to see what are the, um, the mechanisms to, to address this when it happens. The regulatory framework has been through a series of changes. Obviously, the financial crisis that we had in about 2008, you guys are probably too young to remember. So this was the apocalyptic event of the previous uh, bunch of students uh, a decade ago. What happened during the financial crisis revealed that the rules that we had were not necessarily that appropriate and the mechanisms for giving information were not actually working in a way that they would give usable information to people, to people for them to be able to position themselves appropriately. So when the crisis came about, a lot of people were left very bad exposed because either they could not understand the information that was given to them or the quality or quantity of that information was not sufficient. So the previous system that was based on the Financial Services and Markets Act uh, did contain uh, all, all this logic of counterbalancing protections with the provision of information, but it didn't go far enough. And what you had at the time, you had the Financial Services Authority that were responsible for regulating the general environment of the provision of banking and finance and these things. And then you had a part of it, which was the, the UK Licensing Authority that dealt with the stock market and the rules and procedures for entering the stock market. Now, clearly, these weren't working very well because the FSA missed all of these dodgy things that the banks were doing and all these excessive liabilities that the banks were taking, banks were taking on. So when the crisis hit them, they actually lost so much money that they were unable to, to address the problem. And the consequence was felt by everybody else because the state needed to rescue quite a lot of the banks that got into trouble. Effectively, the taxpayer needed to come in and support the banking system for weaknesses and mistakes that the banking system had committed itself. Of course, the private, the private businesses were responsible for putting themselves in a position of danger, but if you've got an entire regulatory framework that's meant to check that, the fact that they missed it or they didn't have the appropriate tools to address it suggests that there was a problem on, on the side of the law. That's why the Financial Services Authority was uh, changed into a different regulator and they tried to break up the task a, a little bit the FSA was a singular regulator that was dealing with all aspects of activity in those types of marketplaces. It, obviously, it was too much for any single, any single authority to do. So the new act, which was the Financial Services Act of 2012, broke down the regulatory function in a, a number of different regulators. So now they have more focused areas of responsibility. The hope is that the new structure has got different parts of 
government bodies looking at different markets and different aspects of the operations of those markets more closely and then if they manage to talk to each other they can spot problems developing and weaknesses developing and they can address them before we move into some kind of major finance crisis. The ironic thing about all this is that this country had a single regulator looking at everything in one go and it didn't work out because they just couldn't manage. Other countries that had multiple regulators according to this system, they ended up in the same place because each regulator was looking, was looking at its own little piece and they were not communicating with each other. So the problems were missed because they didn't have an overall view of what's happening in the market. So these countries that had got lots of different institutions looking at stuff, they created single, single regulators to look at everything at the same time. We, we that we had a single one that didn't manage, we broke it up into a bunch of different ones. This proves that the grass is not greener on the other side, meaning that if you get like significant crisis or you get significant weaknesses in markets, these things develop pretty much on their own and there's no way of supervision or control that's going to make things go away or make a system entirely safe. So primarily based on uh, free interactions and free activity and free contracts, at some point tensions are going to develop that lead to some sort of crisis, no, man no matter who's looking at it or what the institutional arrangements are. Hopefully, these guys now the new system is both more focused in what it's looking and has got better tools for each tools for each piece to communicate with the other so they can spot weaknesses if they're developing now of course it's not going to work you know maybe the way the markets are going at the moment as everything seems to be unraveling will give us an opportunity to test the resilience of those systems but it doesn't necessarily look very good What have we seen so far in terms of information disclosure? We've seen that the, the companies are under obligations to release information to the public. And this happens through some of this information goes back to shareholders in tele. Some information to the registry, so it's available to everybody else. We've already seen through our discussions of director's duties and the issues that come with director's duties that are under strict obligations to produce certain types of funds that we've got the director's patient report, we've got the auditor's report, all of that at higher volumes and at more frequent intervals here corporations. But all of these pieces of uh, documentation need to be both sent to the shareholders and made available to the general public. So people who are already company insiders have got the opportunity to check how the company is doing on the basis of real data data and people who are external to the company they can make informed decisions as to whether they would like to invest or not and we've seen as well the degree to which liability can attach to the directors or the company for misleading statements in these reports uh, we've seen already that the liability links are fairly weak uh, if you're a company insider and the director fails to make these disclosures or they don't populate them with appropriate information, then this would be a breach of director's duties. The response could be that you get rid of this board of directors and you put other people in place. For failing to make disclosures and communications to the registry, then this can result in criminal sanctions for the people themselves who forgot or chose not to do it. But then again, this isn't really, this isn't really geared towards uh, compensating an investor who's made the wrong choice. So it either tells insiders that the board of directors is its job properly, therefore maybe you want to think about changing them, uh, or it tells the, the individual that they've violated or they've kind of misstepped legal obligations and then there's a penalty for that. But again, the focus is not on compensating investors. It changes a little bit for the auditors because a higher degree of, degree of protection is offered if the wrong information comes from the auditor and not the company. Because the company can make mistakes or can, uh, can produce documentation that's not 100% accurate. It's the job of the auditor who has a higher duty to verify these things. So if the wrong information not only came, only came out of the company but it's been stamped and approved by the auditor, then an, an external party could have a claim against the auditor even if they don't have a claim against the company.
This is to incentivize the auditors to do the job properly because the consequences of having inadequate uh, audits could be catastrophic for perceptions of the operation of an economy. It really affects the investment environment. That's why a lot of people are worried about doing business in China, for instance, because nobody trusts the numbers that come out of China, either in the numbers that they produce uh, at the state level or the numbers that they produce the corporates themselves. So there's a big issue about accounting standards and independent accounts and, and the application of independent accounting standards for corporates in China. So this causes concern. Um, and it has an inhibiting effect on uh, business investment. Now, on the other hand, foreign investment in China isn't that easy, but it does cause issues for people who are investing within the country itself. Um, in the West that you've got adherence to international accounting standards, the idea is that everybody uses the same ways of calculating things and communicates the same information. So then the emphasis is on making sure that the accountants do their job and then we all have, we're all operating from the same base in order to compare uh, the performance of corporations. One of the few ways in which <coughs> you would be able to go after um, the directors for inappropriate information that comes out in these kind of stylized statements would be if the directors have created the duty of care through direct communication with you. So even though there is no direct, there is no direct duty to the public, in general for inaccuracies in reports, if a director takes you aside and convinces you to invest in the company on the basis of this information, then their extra action in talking to you specifically that creates a duty of care to you that if the information is false, then it's been breached and then you have a claim against the particular director, not against the company, but against the particular director. Now, coming back to the idea of disclosure, there is no way that you know what you're investing in unless the company engages in full and accurate disclosure of information when they're offering you the opportunity to join them through a stock market. Private companies don't have to worry about these things because, as we said, the membership of a private company is probably determined at the beginning when the company is set and is set. And as in a private limited company, you're not allowed to sell your shares to the wider public and you're not allowed to change the shares and give them to somebody else without the involvement of the company, the turnaround in the shareholding is fairly limited. But you can have a public corporation. Moreover, you can have a public corporate participating in a stock market. What the difference that the stock market makes is that in a stock market, it's very easy to find shares available and it's very easy to compare prices because it's all done through kind of automated processes. You want to buy shares in BT, uh, you can put, a, an, order, uh, you can put a, an order that says I would like X amount of shares and then you will, through the systems of the stock market, you will find people who are willing to sell you those shares. It's like a kind of very quick eBay, right? So if I want to sell, if I want to sell my laptop to you guys, if I want to sell my laptop, in general, each one of you, if you would like to buy it, or I could put notes around the university, or I could use some sort of discussion forum or notice board at the uni. I am trying to reach a fairly limited amount of people but even with it, that limited amount of people, to find somebody who's got the desire to actually buy it, and the desire to actually buy it, and then to get in touch with them personally and negotiate the price is going to take a long time. It would be easier if I can do it in a different way. It could be that I can go to one of those websites that say we will buy anything and you put the description of your product and they, the websites that you go if you want to sell your car, right? You put your registration number, immediately gives you a quote. And it immediately gives you a list of people who are willing to purchase the car because there are the various kind of garages and, and, and kind of big things that will buy anything. But it also helps you to discover prices because if you have an automated process that can, process that can very easily match available uh, sellers with available buyers, not only you click with the person to make the transaction, but also you get a range of prices made available to you very quickly. I'm guessing an intermediate way between a fully automated market that gives you a quote right there and then, 
and asking you individually would be to put it on eBay. So you put something on an auction on eBay, you wait a few days, and that helps you both to access a large one who might be kind of Googling something with this description. And it also allows you to check prices because as you're trying to list your item, it will tell you how much, how much similar items are being offered by other people. And if you've got it on, in an auction, it very easily tests prices for you because, you know, if people are, if what you've put is on high demand, then obviously people are going to bid for it much higher. Yeah. So what the stock market does is that it provides, it provides assurance that you can very quickly meet up other people who are either willing to sell you shares or they're willing to buy yours. This happens within seconds because the systems are fully automated. It doesn't force you into a price. It could be that you, you're willing to uh, sell your shares at a, what is currently in the market and see if anybody bites for whatever reason. Or it could be that you put it much lower because you want to sell it even quicker than what would be normally available. Of course, the effect is that every transaction that takes place affects the price. So if you're looking at the prices in the stock market today, uh, the, price, uh, the price of, say, BT or uh, Apple or Tesco, it's got a particular price for the share. It doesn't mean that all of their shares bought and sold today. It just means that from the transactions that did take place, right, people at that price or pretty much at that price. So it could be that the percent of the total stock has changed hands today, but it gives us an impression. If only one share sold, then that would be the price for today. If 100 shares sold, then it's an average of those. They don't all sell at the same price. Quicker systems, though, require something. So how do you know what it is that you're buying? Know what it is that you're buying? The majority of control takes place at the entry stage. So when a company is offering shares for sale for the first time, then they need to explain a lot of things about themselves to allow the people who make up their minds as to the price. If you're already transacting and if your shares are already circulating, obviously it's easy to find the price and your assumption would be if a whole bunch of people are willing to buy the shares at that price, then I'm probably safe in, in working within that price as well. In, in working within that price as well. But if I'm offering shares for the first time, if I'm a company that's entering the stock market for the first time, I might be willing as the company has 20 pounds a share, but what's there to say for everybody else that this is actually a company that uh, justifies this. You know, obviously I'm trying to make money to invest in something. What if you buy them at 20 and then you try and sell them the next day and people will only buy them for 10? Or what if 20 is an undervalue and people would actually be happy to buy them for 100? How do you make that choice? So for the people, obviously an initial uh, share offering, obviously an initial uh, share offering has a price determined by the company when the, the shares are first launched. But to allow people to evaluate whether that share price is appropriate and to give the assurance that this is a safe, appropriate thing to invest in, the company, need, the company needs to put together lots of information. So every uh, share that gets listed in the stock market will come with an extensive prospectus that is, as it's called, that is put together on the basis of loads and loads of detailed information that is given both by Jenna as to what needs to go into this leaflet, right? You got all this information. It contains a lot of information produced by the accountant, so it feeds in the various responses that, uh, and documentation that the company needs to produce. But it also has got additional things about the plans of the company, the future prospects and all of that. So this is part, part a regulatory compliance it is part genuine uh, financial details about the company, and it is a brochure, a sales item at the same time. But all this needs to be put together in a specific way, um, otherwise it will not be accepted. So put this documentation together, it's not like you put it, you send it, and then they figure out if there's something wrong. Somebody needs to check it before it goes out, yeah? So if you have securities uh, of shares that need to go list in the stock market, if you're making an offer to the public, 
then you need to have the prospectus and the various listing particulars. You need prospectus and the various listing particulars. You need to send them to the, the listing authority for approval before you make them available to the public. And if you have mistakes in there, because you need to have fair and efficient and transparent market reflected in this information, then you get into trouble. And then there are significant, there can be significant penalties if you fail to follow this. Uh, and the penalties can be both of a, of a civil and of a criminal nature. So the Companies Act contains a list of the things that need to be included in the prospectus and the listing in particulars. And the authority that kind of checks all this is uh, UKLA, which is the listing authority. So you need to identify who's responsible for putting the document together. You need to explain what sorts of debt uh, shares or securities are being offered. You need to explain the prices and any mechanisms to determine the prices. You need to talk to people about what the company is like and its capital. Uh, you need to identify major shareholders uh, or any major contracts that the company has. Uh, you need to, if it's in a group of companies, you need to give some information about the group structure as well. You need to include the financial statements, including the auditor's report. You need to give information about the directors, they are, and senior management. And then you need to wrap this up with uh, information about the planning uh, and future prospects of the company as the company sees them. And all of this is going to be checked by the authority. And if it's signed off and approved, then you can proceed to, uh, to, um, to advertise them in order to list to the stock market. If you spot errors that are significant, then you're under a legal obligation to correct them as it's happening. If you have made misstatements or you've got incorrect information that makes its way into this documented, then you can suffer, the company can suffer liability to parties who have suffered loss and they're subject to administrative fines and in cases to criminal liability. Um, so if you look at the Financial Services and Markets Act or in the 2012 uh, version, it specifies the, 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 degree to which, the, the, the degree to which fines are going to kick in, depending on the severity of the mistaken information. And the, uh, the criminal liability is something that is put in there to scare people from uh, being or reckless in the production of this information. <clears throat> if you have statements or forecasts that are dishonest, be facing a criminal sanction for doing this. So not something that you would cook at home, right? If you're thinking about uh, launching in the stock market, it's going to be an expensive proposition because you're going to need expensive advice and um, Lots of lawyers working a lot of hours to put this documentation, of hours to put this documentation together. Now, if any of you are interested in uh, in this aspect of the law for a future career, this is something that pays well. Um, so, if you're working for uh, the solicitors that are advising a company or an investment bank about securities and so on, it pays very well. But it is extremely complex, uh, detailed, and time-consuming work. So these are the sort of stuff that they're going to send you to a data center, and you're going to be there for three weeks staying, staying in some dodgy hotel, and you're going to be spending 12 hours a day going through documents for the documents, for the due diligence, so you can actually make notes on everything that the company does, so then you can feed this back to the investment bank uh, that is going to uh, attempt to value the company, value the assets, and arrive at the valuation as to how they should be, what they should be issuing in terms of seeing at what price, and then to put the documentation together. There is another aspect of this, though, that we need to talk about, which is after the market's operational and after the shares are being traded and after they're present in some stock market, what are people's obligations in relation to this? Now, this has got very significant consequences because the whole uh, point of the system and the whole point of legislation in this area is to ensure that we have fair and transparent markets that operate independently. What does that mean? It means that everybody has the same opportunity to participate in a market. And whether you're buying or selling shares or whatever it is, you should be doing it with the same information as else. 
So whether you're successful or not should depend in your knowledge, your skill, the effort you put in it, to a degree luck, right? But it's mostly the result of your analysis and your cases and your capacity to understand markets and position yourself against them that should make you rich or should make you poor, not some type of inappropriate behavior. And what is inappropriate behavior? Having inside information. So you have, for instance, inside information. Information is something that you get that is not in the public domain, is information that you get through an internal source. It is not meant for public consumption. And you're using this information for private gain. So inside information is something like this with these characteristics. An insider is somebody who obtains this information either because of their position as an insider of the company or through some other function. It could be that you work for the government, you work for the tax office, or you learn something that is private, right, through another route. Or somebody told you. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters that you obtained information you're not meant to have, either directly or by somebody who's already an insider. So if the information is classed as inside information and you are classed as an insider, then you would be committing an offense. Uh, uh, and there's a, a series of legislative instruments that explain this. Uh, the Criminal Justice Act, we've got um, a series of pieces here of legislation that talk about the criminal. We're talking about criminal consequences here. You're going to end up in prison, right? So primarily, uh, the, the insider dealing information is contained in the Criminal Justice Act of 93, sections 52 onwards. Now, you are unbalancing what is supposed to be an open process by transacting on the basis of inside information. And you should end up in prison. So you have prison sentences, you've got uh, fines, you've got all sorts of things. You are barred from, you are barred from working again in these fields. There's, uh, there's a range of things. Now, the, the problem is that sometimes the, the release of insider information is accidental. And it is a difficult line to cross between somebody who is trying to get a deal done and he's trying to communicate with clients, but or he's acting as an intermediary, but the information he passes on needs to stay on the correct, correct side between what is publicly available and what is not. And the, when mistakes happen, this is a case where there was a, a mistake here, here, in the process of negotiation, uh, somebody inadvertently reveals information that is in, inside information, which leads the others to make transactions and benefit in ways that they're not allowed to. The problem is that intent is not an issue here. So if you are an insider and you reveal inside information, then you're subject to all these consequences regardless of intent. So you cannot say that, I'm sorry, I did this accidentally and did away with it. The rules are very strict. And in fact, because instances of these types of inappropriate behavior are becoming more and more common, actually, the more legislation you have about it, the more people you catch doing it, um, they are so strict that now the communications that take place from investment banks or other financial institutions or the lawyers or the regulators, they, they take place in very specified ways. So if you know anybody who works in that part of banking, they're given a phone by the bank and cool, but you got a nice phone. No, this is a phone that records every word you say and sends it back to the bank. So you're only allowed to talk business through specific devices that you've been given that have got specific security uh, features and also most of you are saying. So that way it can be proven if there's, anything that, if there's anything that goes wrong, you can prove precisely what you said, to whom you said it and to when you send it to be able to defend yourself if somebody comes after you and says that you've done something inappropriate. Now, of course, the other side of this is that it makes it easier to catch people who do engage in inappropriate behavior on purpose. Yeah? So you need, to, you need to look into this idea of inside information and who's an insider, how the law deals with it, what is considered to be appropriate information. And we, what of this comes to uh, the behavior of directors? Week when the director thinks, wow, this business is going badly. Why don't I sell my shares? Right? And they're not allowed to do this. Because, because 
if I know that the business is doing badly because I'm an insider, I'm the one running the business. So if I'm making transactions uh, on the basis of that information, this is unfair to everybody else. Or if I tell you know, my friends to do it, again, they become privy to information that is not in the public domain, so they're getting an unfair advantage by this legislation. And it's not only um, inside information in that sense that is controlled. You've got a series of other offenses. Uh, you've got, for instance, um, types of manipulation and types of market abuse that are also covered. Because it could be that what you're doing, you're transacting now, and you're not, you're not an insider, but you're trying to influence the market. You're spreading rumors about stuff. So you're spreading rumors that are not true. The aim of doing this is to create a market or to manipulate a market so then you can position yourself against it. So you're saying, I'm going to go, so you're saying, I'm going to go buy some shares in this and I'm going to start spreading rumors about a great deal coming on. Right? So then the price is going to increase. Then I sell them. By the time everybody realized that all this was fake and nothing was going on, I've walked away with the money. So these are the sort of things that are covered by additional rules that have to do market abuse uh, and market manipulation. All of these end up being criminal offenses as well. So you're going to find information uh, in the statute that I mentioned also in the Financial, Financial Services Act of 2012 that criminalize various types of uh, trying to create false markets or spread information about false markets and all the rest of it. And this links up really nicely with the stuff that we have about directors and the violations that directors can engage in. These are going to be di director violations not against the company but usually against other people. All of this comes from European regulations that have been put into place to deal with this in the single market. Now, of course, in the context of Brexit, it is within the remit of this government to take all these away. If they take all these away, then they might have trouble accessing markets and they will make the sort of investment propositions that British firms present very different uh, from anybody on the outside. So, so far, all, this, um, all of this legislative and regulatory work is on the basis of European directives. Uh, it remains in place. Were it to change, we'll see it when it changes. But if they start changing this stuff, removing the penalties, uh, it could be that they increase them or it could be that they remove them. The assumption is that they're going to try and remove them. It will affect the investor's perception as to the security of this information uh, or as to the balance of this market. So if less of these checks and balances are in, and balances are in place, then it becomes more of a kind of gambling exercise than, than it was before. So it will, it will change the way these markets are perceived in the future.